G'day folks, it's good to be back in front of the camera again. Um, today what I wanted to go through is two lessons that I've learned in season 2022. So these are AFL draft related lessons. So to go through, so this is a list that I made as it has here in November 2021 and this is looking at the top 10 players that I was at the time projecting for the 2022 AFL draft. So we've got Will Ashcroft there. He was looking like a clear pick one even then, as you can read here. Um, but the first thing that really pops out when I go through this list is the talls. So firstly, you've got Jackson Broadbent. So um, really looked like a promising ruckman at this stage. Lanky, but covered the ground well, found a heap of it. Um, and very advanced game, and as well, December birthday. So they're all good indicators. But, of course, didn't develop this year, went undrafted. So, and he was looking like a clear top 10 pick. Anyone putting together a top 10 would have had Broadbent in that list. I'd be very hard-pressed to find anyone who wouldn't. <coughs> Jed Buzzlinger, tick, good pick. The other tolls as well, and this really tells the story, You've got Isaac Keeler, late pick. Harry Lemmy, late pick. Neither really improved this year all that much. Keeler took some steps in the right direction, but didn't improve as much as expected, as evidenced, of course, by his not featuring inside the top 10 in this year's draft or even first round. And then with a Harry Lemmy as well. He's someone who regressed this year. And look, his under-18 championships were not good at all. You could put all three of his games together, add all the numbers up, still ordinary numbers. So... Um, that's how poorly he played during that time. But, um, yeah, and then look, even outside this list, so um, my next two and the two that I was considering for this list, and I don't believe in any other videos I've actually disclosed these names, but I had Mateus Filippo, so that's a tick but not key position player, but I bring it up because the other player is a key position player in Tom Scully, so... Um, of course, very heavy South Australian representation in this draft. And it was because, of course, in um, 2021, well, I didn't have a lot of Victorian footy to watch. It was a lot of, um, in particular, watching the Sandfall, given um, having access to the Sandfall um, League Pass and really, yeah, not being able to see as much of the other states comparatively. So, um, but yeah, with the Tom Scully again, looked like, I had him as a top sort of 15 pick and really liked him on potential. And look, he showed great scope early in the season and then really dropped off. But again, late pick. So I guess the story that I wanted to tell with the Tolls is that I guess rating them too highly too early on can come back to bite you. So if you're looking like a transcendent player a year out, such as I would say of a Jack Lacocious, as for me at least the best um, junior footballer that I've seen in terms of when projecting ahead what they have the scope to be in their AFL career. Of course, he hasn't reached the heights of one of the best players in the comp or even by position. He's, of course, a very good footballer at AFL level. But um, the point remains, like, unless you're that level, a Max King is an example for another from that draft, well, you, you need to have some level of caution because oftentimes you'll have these key position players a year out that are performing to really at quite a high level and even a high level compared to their draft peers in other positions and those even a year older at times. But the key comes back to rate of improvement. So without seeing the rate of improvement shown by players in their draft year, you really can't at all calculate how good they're going to be for their career. So um, one notable absentee that hopefully a few of you at home have noticed, is Aaron Cadman. So top pick in this year's AFL draft, but absent from this list. And I can tell you now, he wasn't... If I was to put together a top 30 at this point in time, this time last year, Cadman would not have made my top 30. So um, maybe there's someone out there, maybe a Victorian scout that had seen a lot of him at the time that thought that. But um, yeah, look, really with Cadman, what's made him such a draftable player and the top pick in this year's draft is the rate of improvement in combination, of course, with the production in his draft year and the attributes demonstrated. So um, the key learning, basically, to put it briefly with the tolls, is a year out, you don't want to rate him too highly. 
You really have to, I guess, almost taper down those expectations a notch and really almost move them down a tier in your tier list would be my personal tip in really looking that year out. And really, I guess, because I've found over time, historically, when I go through um, my sort of power rankings from drafts past, I've had all these key position players really high early on in the year, and I've had to bring them back consistently over the course of the years. Not all of them, but with more than not, and many more than I'm bringing up. So basically for me, that was really an important learning. And in putting together a top 10 list for 2023, which as you can see, um, you can find on espn.com.au slash AFL. Well, in completing this list, I really had to taper back I guess, the expectations on um, the talls. So you've got a Nate Caddy who's around a 190. He's key position-ish, but he's really just like a tallish lead-up forward who may even sort of become more of a midfielder in the coming year. We'll see if he can sort of make that transition to also be an impact player through the midfielder. You've got a Curtin who, um, look, is probably a top three pick in quality, honestly, I'd be saying. Just phenomenal key defender, has to be in your top 10 if he's not already. Um, and the other one that I've included, of course, is Jed Walter, who he has, he has a man's body. So look, he's incredibly advanced for his age, but like he, he was basically playing like a first round pick if he was to be picked in this year's draft. So um yeah, so that's why he makes this list because not only is he advanced, but like he's dominant for his age. So um, that's why he makes it. So, um, but the two that I did consider, so we had Archer Reed, so the younger brother of Essendon's Zach. So he's about a 201 centimeter um, key forward, had some big games this year and has the attributes to be great. But I held him out of this list because he has had, several quiet games where he has been invisible and look I could easily make a case for if I was to say who was my 10th player Nate Caddy so Archer Reed was strongly in that mix but had to have him miss out given I guess some others from this list are better performed and there is still that element of speculating with an Archer Reed that um, he will be there in that sort of top 10 group this time next year. So taking the learnings from the last 12 months, that's why he misses out. And I could say the same of Mitch Edwards. So a 205 centimeter um, Ruckman from WA. So it reads a bit sort of familiar here with a Jackson Broad bent being that sort of um, Ruckman with potential. So with an Edwards, he's just as good, if not maybe slightly better than Broadbent was 12 months out. So um, look, I could very easily make a case for him being in this group. But um, my decision was that, look, with Ruckman even more so than key position players, if you look through the history of drafts past, so many that have featured as rookies of the Ruckman have actually become the best in the in the comp. So whether it's your Dean Cox, Aaron Sanderland, Shane Mumford, Darren Jolly, the list goes on. Rowan Marshall, doesn't matter. I, I could list another five to 10 if I wanted to. But you don't have to be an early pick to be a good Ruckman. And those particularly pre-2012 that went early draft, the vast majority of them did not deserve to go as early as they should have, at least in hindsight. So you really do have to taper back those expectations with Ruckman and really, again, move them down one, if not two tiers with probably the key position players down one tier in your tier lists or equivalents, or at least based on how I've been rating players on performance in that sort of year out from their draft. The other thing that I wanted to bring up, so we've got Broadbent, of course, who missed out on getting drafted, but you've got Adam D. Lawyer. He was South Australia's MVP, so had a terrific year, but undrafted. And the other one, of course, is Kobe Ryan. So he's had a good year too. He's been playing in the sand for against league opposition, and he averaged more disposals in his draft year than Jason Horn Francis did the year before. So um, Kobe Ryan can play too, for those at home that aren't sure. But... The trend is, so why weren't they drafted? Well, they're just midfielders, and that's the problem. So if we go into this year's draft, if we look through the top names. I could have had this prepared before. 
But if we go through the top names, so you've got Sheasel. Well, he's a forward who can push through the midfield. Wardlaw, look, midfielder, Sardis midfielder. But then you've got Humphrey. Well, he's incredible as a forward. Mackenzie, look, mostly midfielder, but can play outside. Jai Clark, he can play forward. Ginby, he's been playing in defense. Filippo, um, he's great forward. So when you look through so many of the names, a lot of them have really become multi-positional. And that's the thing that I think we're going to find over coming years, that unless you project to be a number one ball winner for a team, you cannot be picked as just a contested ball winning midfielder. So um, that's something that as well, because ultimately when I've gone through my power rankings over the year, what I've done very differently and more differently than any other component to putting together my power rankings is those that win a high possession contested, I've always had higher, at least on average, than AFL clubs have in their rankings. So the likes of a Kobe Ryan, I really rated and actually still had reasonably high in my draft board. Same with an Adam D. Lawyer again this year. I still thought coming into this year's draft, he's a ripper. Someone draft him, he represents really good value. So, um, but it's just a case of the game's changing. So... Um, they're looking for players that have multiple dimensions. So if you're a contested ball winner, well, what else have you got? Well, with an Adam D. Lawyer, you're looking at a contested ball winner, strong tackler can distribute inside, but what's that other weapon? So um, is he going to, for AFL purposes, be someone who's a really good forward? So yeah, it's hit the scoreboard a little bit in the sand for under 18s, but for AFL purposes, can he also play forward enough and be good enough as a forward to be able to also be part of a midfield? So they're the sort of questions that will be asked. So in 2012, we've seen that real transition to more players than not a multi-positional, and we're also going to see that continued move for the 2023 draft, where when you're looking through the names, well, they're not just pure mids. You've got a Nate Caddy. Well, he's a lead-up forward who might be able to add midfield craft to his game. You've got a Curden, well, key defender. Jack Deline, he's another forward. So maybe he can push into the midfield a little this year. That would certainly help his draft stocks, but he's a really good forward. Zane Dersma, well, yeah, you can put him in the midfield, but again, he's a forward. Will Lorenz, midfielder, um, but you could put him forward, no problem. You've got um, Ashton Wa, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but look, he's a forward. So he's a forward who can push through the midfield. You could probably play him back as well, but multi-positional. Harley Reid, you can play him through the midfield, sure, but across half back, he's a weapon. He's like a Luke Hodge with how he orchestrates the drive and rebound from defense. Or you could put him in the goal square up forward and he's going to dominate guys one-on-one, as, say, a Dusty Martin would. So you've got someone who, across three positions across three positions isn't just good, but is dominant. So that's what we've got to look forward to as our probable number one pick next year, folks. Um, You've got a Tholstrup, well, forward mid, so, and a Nick Watson, well, small forward, but he could also plausibly, though for AFL purposes probably not, also go through the midfield. So we've got a group of players coming up that aren't pure mids. None of them really are your pure mids. They're all your multi-positional players. So this is how the game is changing, folks, and this is something to get used to. So you're not going to be seeing your Tom Mitchells or your Lockie Neals. We're not going to have too many of those types anymore. You might be limited to about one per team, and then it'll be a case if you've got all these multi-positional guys who um, either sort of, if they're playing inside, well, they're going to have to go forward, or maybe they push outside, or maybe they go back. So... They're the types of players that we're going to be seeing more and more. And for that reason, your pure, pure mids, unless they project to be those absolute superstars, as I'd be saying of a Will Ashcroft, who is highly likely in the future to be a top 10 midfielder in the competition, um, unless you're projecting those types of guys ahead or... Maybe it's a Wardlaw who, although I wouldn't necessarily agree with this conclusion, but there were some saying leading up to this draft that um, a Wardlaw is the best player in this draft or in the 2022 draft. Well, they're the sort of midfielders that will be sort of able to be picked as your pure mids. Whereas your Kobe Ryans and your Adam D. Lawyers, even if they're 
um, MVPs for their state during the under-18 champs or dominating at sand for league level or if someone in the waffle was doing the same against league opposition. Well, that's how the game is changing, folks. So for me, I really need to adjust that focus with these contested ball-winning mids to, well, if you're a contested ball-winning mid, well, what other position do you play? What other weapons do you have? Because that's how the game's changing. Thanks for watching folks, and if you enjoy this video, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for future updates. Um, over the coming weeks and months, I do have more videos planned, mostly around the AFL draft, where it'll be a real opportunity for me because I watch sort of 10 to 12 games a week during the year between AFL, under 18s, and state leagues. It's really an opportunity for me where I've actually got time to make videos. I'm actually on holidays. so. Um, basically for video producing, this is my best time of year to actually have time. So that's probably not when most of you would be wanting to watch me. You'd probably want to watch me more in the lead up to the draft. So apologies for that sort of lack of availability during that time with ESPN commitments, watching games in the lead up to. So, um, yeah, that's sort of how those dynamics play out. But yeah, basically I've got a lot planned and, um, just before actually producing this video, I did a collab with, um, Supercoach DR. So... Um, basically talking about Supercoach and the Collingwood players um, who might be of potential interest for Supercoach. So if you're into Supercoach or if you're a Collingwood fan, make sure you check that out because I've included quite a few exclusive nuggets in there that you won't hear anywhere else regarding Collingwood, how they play, how some of the players play, what they've been doing in the VFL or in the junior ranks, what their numbers are and what I'm projecting. So um, that's a really good watch. So I'll leave a link in the description for that. But um, also I probably haven't mentioned that I've done, I've completed, um, reviews for the 2022 AFL draft on ESPN.com.au slash AFL. So I'll link those below as well, both a first round review and a full draft review. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in those for, um, I guess a complete view at everyone picked and all the trades completed and basically who I rated of those drafted and which teams I think did well, make sure you check those out. And if you have any questions around um, those that have been drafted this year, or perhaps you might want to know a bit about for the 2023 draft, well, hit me up in the comments section below. But um, yeah, anyway, folks, see you in the next video.